Hey guys, Nishclick here. Today, I'm going to take you guys on an adventure. An adventure through my life, which spans four years. And you might be thinking, what is this like expansive four-year-long adventure going on? Well, it is the adventure of me attempting to and finally completing the video game Final Fantasy VII. And you might be like, what? Four years? What, what is this? What is this nonsense? Well, you might have seen the title of this video. Learning to love Final Fantasy VII, despite three failed attempts. Well, yeah, it really took a while to get here. But where I am right now, I can firmly say that I have changed, I have matured, and I have really grown as a gamer, a fan of video games, and a fan of JRPGs. You guys know that about me. JRPGs, my favorite genre. If it wasn't for Final Fantasy VII, I wouldn't be in this position right now, talking to you guys right now. And I wouldn't be as hyped as I am for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. So without further ado, let's get started and I want to show you guys what a long, arduous journey this has been. Because it really has, and it takes me all the way back to 2019 when I first started getting into this beloved, amazing genre of video games. And if you enjoy Final Fantasy, if you enjoy JRPGs, if you're excited for Rebirth, why don't you hit that subscribe button because that's what I talk about here on the channel. I love JRPGs, I also love Nintendo games. If you enjoy any of those, subscribe down below and give this video a like, it really helps out. This video has been in the making for a very long time. Well, first of all, it's been in the back of my head for as long as I can remember, almost ever since I started this channel. And I'm finally talking to you guys about this journey. I can't wait. So without further ado, let's get started. My history with Final Fantasy VII takes me all the way back into my deep, dive into the JRPG genre. I keep mentioning here that my intro into JRPGs was with Fire Emblem Awakening, and aside from Pokemon, yeah, that's what it was. But aside from that game and Fire Emblem 7 Blazing Blade, which I casually played, I never played a Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Xenoblade, Tales of, or even Persona game until my early 20s. I don't know if any of you guys knew this, but I always knew about Final Fantasy though, and especially 7. I remember how big of a deal it was when Cloud got into Smash, and that was somewhat of a catalyst for me to get into the series. But the big push was in the February 2019 Nintendo Direct, when Final Fantasy 7 VII and 9 were released on the Nintendo Switch. I immediately bought them with the hopes of steamrolling through both, and being one of the cool kids who actually plays these kinds of games that Resonant Arc and Night Sky Prince all talked about. <laughs> the news on the approaching remake also enticed me quite a bit. So summer of 2019 finally came and I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I finally jumped in to Final Fantasy 7. My first attempt was interesting to say the least, since like I said, I was only really used to Pokemon and Fire Emblem as turn-based games, if you can even consider Fire Emblem as turn-based. I forgot random encounters were a thing, I forgot menu management was a thing, I also had no idea what this wait bar was, like can I, can I not attack the enemy, why do I have to wait? And because of that, whenever I looked up guides, I had to really wrap my head around the concept of what this ATB system was. <laughs> this is back when I was a completely different kind of gamer. The only games I had been playing for the past two years at this point were Super Smash Bros. Ultimate and Breath of the Wild. So excuse my idiocy here of my older self. But even the material mechanic was just kind of something that just went over my head. And the somewhat primitive graphics were just unappealing, and the fact that the characters were all triangular blocks, it just felt kinda weird to me. The fact that I felt this way 
so weird to me in the first place. Like, I loved games like Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Super Mario 64, etc. Could this be because this was one of my first PS1 games? Well, perhaps, but I will say though, my experience with JRPGs has significantly and positively increased, and I have updated opinions and tastes on various aspects of this game, but I will still say I still cannot get over the original look of this game. To say it has aged poorly is kind of an understatement, and even compared to other PS1 games, notably Xenogears and Metal Gear Solid, which both released shortly after Final Fantasy VII, a year after. Like, look at these games. They look so much better, in my opinion, compared to Final Fantasy VII. I just don't think Final Fantasy VII stands the test of time like some of these other games do, and even especially some of these N64 games. I'll go into more detail in my later attempts of the game later on in the video, but long story short, I gave up the same summer in August after playing on and off for about two months, and how far did I get, you might ask? Eh, it was just the library puzzle in the Shinra building. <laughs> hey, it was a busy summer, and just I played a lot of Breath of the Wild. <laughs> So, early 2022 rolls by and my RPG credentials have increased quite a bit. I got the first two Xenoblade games under my belt and even Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5 Royal. I was so seasoned by now, I knew I could tackle any turn-based RPG easily no matter how old it was. Oh, also I played a bit of Final Fantasy VI, but quit because I was playing it on my phone via a GBA emulator, aka the worst way to play this game. <laughs> but then I had the genius idea. How about I skip Final Fantasy VII on the Switch and play the shiny new remake on the PS5? The free upgrade was out, so I thought, hey, why not? Because I already have this game on PS4, so why not just upgrade to the PS5? And all my friends who really didn't play RPGs really loved Final Fantasy VII Remake. So what I did is I ran it by my Final Fantasy VII friends, the OGs, the ones who know what they're talking about. And he here, here's what happened. I'll, I'll let you see exactly what happened. So supposedly I needed context of the original game to even understand the remake, which was only covering less than like a third of the original game. That 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 that's supposed to make sense. What bogus? So here goes attempt two. This one didn't last very long, but one simple choice will trigger a lasting impression and create a tidal wave, an effect, of my entire Final Fantasy VII experience. Here's what I chose to do. It was something very stupid and unintelligent, but I did it anyways. I played the game with 100% limit break, zero random encounters, and 2 times speed. 2 times speed was a great idea, but the other two kinda came back to bite me in the ass. <laughs> because of the release of a certain Gigantic Souls game and my favorite Nintendo Switch game of all time, I had to put Final Fantasy VII on hold yet again, but this time I stopped at the end of Midgard because my silly little self had the genius idea to not listen to my friends and stop there and just play the remake. Because the remake is Midgar, right? Exactly. I knew everything that happened in Midgar, so I was totally ready for the remake. Though, after the hype of Xenoblade 3 and all these games, 
I ended up jumping back into the original FF7 even before Remake, but little did I know I was in for quite the surprise. The third attempt started off strong since it was my first real introduction to the grander story of Final Fantasy VII, the backstory of Cloud and Sephiroth, and a look into what happens in Nibelheim from Cloud's perspective. It really intrigued me and set me up for what's going to come soon. Attempt 3 started in calm and gave me the first look at what's finally outside Midgar. The large expansive world, the beautiful music, the Chocobo Farm, Corel, the Gold Saucer, the emotional encounter with Dine, the lore dump in Cosmo Canyon, the emotional moment with Red 13 and Bugenhagen, and so many more iconic moments. But one thing was still constant. I wasn't really trying. My mentality was just to play it for the story and do the hacks I mentioned earlier to get by. But I soon realized how silly of an idea that was when I encountered uh, this guy. <laughs> the Materia Keeper was the boss that finally filtered me and foiled my stupid plan of ultimate limit breaks and zero random encounters. My decision to go with zero random encounters, of course, led me to hardly ever grind or level up, and only really level up on the required bosses and required fights. And that meant I was only relying on limit breaks and worthless materia. My limit breaks weren't strong enough to penetrate the mighty defenses of the materia keeper. My plan was foiled. This loss really hit me. I thought to myself, how could my once perfect plan crumble so easily? And not only that, how could I be so stupid? Why wasn't I taking this seriously? Why wasn't I trying? Was it just that I wasn't clicking with the game? Did I hate the art style that much? Was the menu just that annoying to cycle through? Am I a lost cause in this journey to complete one of the greatest JRPGs of all time? How could I criticize others for not taking this genre seriously when I can't even beat the genre's most revolutionary game? The Materia Keeper really got me thinking. It was a sign. The next time I play the game, I have to take this seriously. I have to treat this like a game. So what did I do next? Well, I ended up playing the remake, of course, which I loved. I loved the combat. I loved the flashiness, the visuals, and with the context of Midgar, I recognized so many places, so many people, so many references, and even some songs on the radio from areas outside of Midgar. Some things didn't really make sense and kind of went over my head, but that's natural because I didn't, I didn't take the advice from my friends that I should have. Overall, a great time, but I'll get back to this later because after completing Remake, I took a deep dive into a recap of the original game, courtesy of Zygor Gaming. At this time, there was a lot of talk about Crisis Core and Rebirth since we just had the Final Fantasy VII 25th Anniversary stream which announced all these projects, so I spoiled the story for myself, but my philosophy and motto with games is that experiencing games for yourself is vastly different from any other way of consuming the media. Just like how I've mentioned in videos about Persona 3 Reload, just watching a let's play of Fez to understand the story didn't cut it for me. I needed to experience the story moments for myself, like what I'm currently doing with Reload right now. And just like with Persona 3, over the next couple of months and years, I started to slowly forget moments of the story because I just watched that recap. I never really played the game for myself. Who was Zack again, and what did he do to make Cloud's memory all foggy, and what does Sephiroth want to do to destroy the world, like what's the whole black materia thing, why does he want to do this anyways? Like, So many questions were swirling in my head about this game, and these questions just beckoned me to start Final Fantasy VII once again. And with the hype of 16, I thought to myself, I need to binge this series. 
I basically only play JRPGs now, like, wow, look how far I've come. And I've only beaten one Final Fantasy game, which is Remake. That needs to change. I have to play 9, 10, OG7 is still in my backlog, I need to marathon them. But then, the dreadful thought came back to me. Playing Final Fantasy 7, three failed attempts, will the fourth one be the one to break it? Will the fourth time be the charm? Twenty twenty three was a busy year, personally and gaming wise as well. Two new releases in my two favorite video game franchises, plus many other RPGs checked off my backlog. When would I start this Final Fantasy marathon and binge that I have supposedly subjected myself to? I guess whenever I beat 16, right? Well, luckily I was gifted 16 as a birthday present, shout out to my friends who got me that as a gift. I beat that and I jumped right into... Sea of Stars. <laughs> I was really avoiding Final Fantasy VII. And then I just, I remembered Materia Keeper, I remember the lesson that he taught me. And then I thought about the polygons, the 2D backgrounds that made me so confused as to where I was supposed to go, the annoying menu scrolling, all the annoyances I had. But then I was blessed by one particular video, Eric Ladd's quick review on the 7th Heaven mod for the PC version of Final Fantasy VII. Shout out to Eric Ladd, by the way, one of my favorite new JRPG content creators that I've discovered on YouTube. Give him a subscribe, check out his channel down below. I saw this and I immediately thought, hey, this fixes a lot of my problems. This could be it. The final push that makes me finally complete Final Fantasy VII. With the 7th Heaven mod manager, I could elevate the backgrounds to actually help me know where I'm going. I could change the character model so they don't look like triangular blocks that you find in elementary school playpens. I could even modify the UI to make it cleaner, nicer, and slightly easier to navigate. How did this all turn out? Interestingly, to say the least. So I started this off on my PC, but immediately something was off. I wasn't playing it like the ideal JRPG way that I'm familiar with. I have a video coming out on this topic sometime in the future, but the way I am now, I just can't sit down for long hours on my PC or PS5 to play video games. I need the handheld option to play in short bursts, like with the Nintendo Switch. Especially if I'm playing a JRPG. Like, it really hit me when I was playing this modded version when I hit Cosmo Canyon. I just realized this game is going by a little slowly and I just hate playing it on my PC. Sometimes I have entire sessions where I either just grind or I don't do much at all and it feels like it would be better fit if I just had it in handheld. Like, with a Nintendo Switch. Or... A Steam Deck. And luckily... By some crazy configurations with some amazing tutorial guides and sifting through folders, getting out the external keyboard and mouse plus USB-C hub for desktop mode, I finally got my save file all on my Steam Deck. Luckily, I managed to get my entire save file over from that point, so I remember I was in the cave within Cosmo Canyon when I ended off on PC, I moved the save file all over, and I started from that exact same point on the Steam Deck. So did I have any issues playing on the deck? Yeah, a bit, but nothing to screw up the entire experience. Since I was playing with mods, things were a little slower at times, and loading took a little longer, especially when I got into random encounters. It wasn't truly seamless. Also, some FMVs and cutscenes just felt a little bit off. I had two massive problems though. One lasted the entirety of the game, and the other only a portion, but it was a long portion. So because of some weird problem I couldn't really diagnose and solve, the speed hack unfortunately did not work when I played on Steam Deck. 
I couldn't play it in 2 to 4 times speed for some reason like I could on my PC. And that definitely did suck in very long boss fights where I had to use summons a lot. And hey, at least the summon animations went hard and were awesome to look at. Also, it was an issue when I wanted to grind for levels, money, or materia. Slight inconvenience, but nothing that stopped my playthrough entirely. The other problem was some mini games. <laughs> so on the mod manager, I could toggle any mod on or off. But one I kept off was the mini games mod, which enhances some of the textures and backgrounds in the mini games. The only one I really did was Fort Condor, and I only did that like once or twice. But it, I didn't really seek out any other mini games except the ones that were mandatory. I then got to the snowboarding part after the Temple of the Ancients and the City of the Ancients and all that. I don't know if this counted as a mini game, but I kid you not. This part of the game ran literally at 5 FPS on my Steam Deck. I couldn't count the frames on the deck, but it was so incredibly slow, I had to sit through two separate two hour sessions of me slowly snowboarding at a snail's pace while suspending in between to do other things and go out and do other tasks. And when I was playing, I had to make sure I was turning left or right so I didn't crash. If I did crash, I had to wait almost two whole minutes for Cloud to get back up. I have no idea what caused this, but luckily I managed to get past this and the rest of the game was fine. Smooth sailing. Totally okay. Oh, also the submarine part also ran a little slow for me, but nothing as bad as the snowboarding part. That was just insane. Probably a Steam Deck mod issue or something. It was nice playing in handheld mode at 60 FPS though. I'd play a bit more in bed before heading to sleep. Or if I had some free time, I'd pop in for a bit, I'd play for like a short 30 minute to 1 hour burst and it made play sessions where I had to grind or level up some material or get some more money or do some small tasks. It made that a lot more manageable. And the best part was I could suspend because I was on a handheld device. So picking up where I left off was very easy. Also, we're pretty far into this video already, but this is kind of where the actual review of Final Fantasy VII is going to start. This isn't your typical review. A lot of what I was talking about right now is just my experience with the game, but now I'll be talking about what I think about the story, the characters, the gameplay, the combat, the music, all that stuff. It took a while, but here is my review of Final Fantasy VII. So this, this is the one, this is the Final Fantasy that broke the barriers, that kind of shifted the scene, that kind of laid the groundwork for a lot of JRPGs going forward, and most importantly, it really put JRPGs in the eyes of many people who didn't really know about the genre before. I have actually talked to a lot of friends, content creators, and even family and family friends who originally played this game back on the PS1 in 1997. A lot of times when I play classic games like this, I try my best to put myself in the shoe of the player all the way back then. I have to say, it was a little tougher for me to do this in Final Fantasy VII, and I can't really say exactly why. I did it for Ocarina of Time, and as recent as games like Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metroid Prime, and even Chrono Trigger, but Chrono Trigger is an exception, that game has aged very well. In contrast to Final Fantasy 7 though, I don't think this game has aged as well as some of those other games. And for many reasons I've stated above, visuals, menus, and other things I'll get into later, but did I hate it? No, I enjoyed myself. Through the thick and thin, I had a good time. I enjoyed the game, but it did take a while to get there. I I'm not gonna recap the story because you guys probably already know what happens, you guys know the characters as well, so no need for a recap there. So The characters 
and team dynamic is most definitely iconic, but they took some getting used to. I knew a lot of them from remakes, so characterization from simple dialogue and small movements wasn't too difficult for most of them, but others like Sid and Kate Sith were just kind of meh to me. Actually, not really meh, I just didn't really like Sid in this version. I personally just hope he's better in Rebirth. The whole Rocket Town part was also just not one of my favorite parts in the game. And even though I knew a lot of these characters from Remake, the reason they took some getting used to was the relatability aspect. At first, I could only find things I just didn't really vibe with them about. Only farther into the game, I was able to connect with a lot of them a lot more. And I wish there was more moments like the Corel section for Barrett. And Aerith, of course, had a lot to do in the plot, but sometimes I felt like others were just along the way for the ride, only to play a very important role way, way, way later into the game. Case in point was Tifa. I, f I actually felt this way about her. I liked how Tifa was so close to Cloud from the start, though her distance in the midpoint of the game, though kind of valid, made me sort of lose touch with her character a little bit. Well, only for the livestream segment to happen, making me really appreciate her a lot more. And then only for her to say this to Cloud? What? Do you really say this to a guy who's been through some severe mental anguish, amnesia, and trauma? Come on, Tifa. <laughs> In the end, Avalanche is cool. They're great. But I think what's so cool about them is they really live up to the eco-terrorist title. As fleshed out as they are, sometimes they aren't always likable, which to me makes them all that more interesting. But not only that, the others who join you like Red 13, Vincent, and Kate Sith do find their purpose along the way, and they each have their own reason to take down Sephiroth. A really standout moment to me is before you take off to the Northern Cave. Cloud asks everyone to take a step back and really consider why they're here and why they want to defeat Sephiroth. It's a really insightful moment, which gives some really cool motivations to some of the party members. Not only do they have their own motivation, but there are also troubled people with interesting and even questionable backstories. And they're also not always painted as the usual good guys in a JRPG party. Let me explain. Like, Vincent was once a Turk. Kate Sith is actually controlled by Reeve, who's a high-ranking officer in Shinra. Barrett is against Shinra, but realizes that he's also hurt innocent people in his reactor explosions. Tifa is good, but she's harboring deep secrets from Cloud. Red 13 harbors guilt and grudges of his family's past. Sid is just a, kind of a dick, and <laughs> so on and so forth. Of course, I can forget the two standouts, Cloud and Aerith. I don't have much to say on the latter, other than her death was a standout moment to see in the game. Also, with the backstory of Crisis Core and all that I now understand, it makes her relationship with Cloud a lot stronger, since I can tell now, she saw a lot of Zack in him. I really want to talk about Cloud though. In attempts 1 through 3, I didn't really care for him. He didn't have a personality, or much of an interesting character, and even in Remake, I just didn't vibe with him at all. To me, he was no Shulk, Rex, Noah, or even before Attempt 4, not even someone like Clive. I really vibed with Clive compared to someone like Cloud and Remake. I just didn't vibe with this dude until I learned more about Nibelheim, more about his connection to Sephiroth as a failed clone, more about his past with his friend Zack, which leads him to pick up the Buster Sword. More about his connection to Hojo, who sees him as a failed experiment. And most of all, all the alterations of his memories. A lot of Final Fantasy VII story is really truly about what is real and coming to terms with reality. And Cloud's memories were a true example of all of that. Once you understand what really happened at Nibelheim, it recontextualizes the entire story. 
It's a truly wholesome arc. Cloud remembers things like his promise to Tifa, but his Mako poisoning altered his memories of Nibelheim so much that he believes he's a soldier first class and he experienced all of Zack's memories in that moment. It's sad because it ends happily, since Cloud remembers that he was still able to be there for Tifa in that very moment in Nibelheim. I really like that. Not only that, but Cloud being a shadow of Sephiroth led to some really intense moments in this game. Cloud almost killing Aerith and Cloud handing over the Black Materia to Sephiroth were some very tense moments for his character. He was just a puppet for Sephiroth, but also a very broken man who's been through so much trauma and hardship, but it's inspiring. Cloud deals with his failure of not getting into Soldier, so much so, he hides himself away from Tifa and Nibelheim. He deals with the pain of Mako poisoning and memory alteration after Nibelheim. He deals with the mind controlling from Sephiroth as a failed clone and again deals with severe Mako poisoning again, only to come to terms with everything in his life. But he comes out the other side as a stronger man and a stronger soldier, eh, only for Tifa to put him down again. Otherwise, the story is great. It took some time to get going, but it really does find its footing, especially leading up to the Temple of the Ancients and onwards. Some down parts like Rocket Town and some parts of the huge Materia quest were a little drawn out, but it was a narrative that kept me going throughout. I will say though, it didn't really capture my attention as much as other RPGs. It's no Xenoblade or Chrono Trigger to me. And even compared to other RPGs in recent memories, I don't know if it stacks up narrative-wise, but, but the more I think about the game's story, the more I enjoy it. Also, having known the development history with this game and Xenogears, I am very curious to see how I appreciate the story of Xenogears compared to this game whenever I get around to playing that. I know the story of Xenogears, and I can see a lot of parallels to that here in Final Fantasy VII, but that story and discussion is for another time and another video. And one more thing, I hate to say this, but I feel like I might even enjoy the stories of Final Fantasy IX and X a little bit more, but why is that the case? Just let me explain. You see, the whole, like, vibe of... Seven sci-fi setting didn't really initially appeal to me. To me, I personally prefer stories and settings where games are set in fantasy aesthetics, like high fantasy aesthetics, more traditional fantasy aesthetics, and Seven miss the fantasy element at times. Once you leave Midgar and explore more interesting areas like the Temple of the Ancients, the Northern Cave, you get to see more fantastical elements and enemies and moments. It's a whole kind of vibe that I didn't vibe with initially, but I grew to appreciate. And it is a fantasy in the end, looking back at it. It's very fantastical, but it's not the cup of tea I'm usually drawn to in RPG settings. The whole Shinra setting and Shinra vibe was initially interesting, but I kind of grew tired of it. Artistically though, I like how all the characters seem very diverse and unique, and no two characters in your party are the same at all. Okay, I think I should finally mention the gameplay and combat. This is my first exposure to ATV combat, which was cool, but it was very confusing at first. And going all the way back to attempt one, I was so confused why I had to wait to cast my spells and turns initially, but I later not only grew to accept it, but understand and appreciate ATV combat as well, later learning to even use it to my advantage. This game really made me wrap my head around the Square Enix terms for magic and spells as well. I knew the usual Firaga, Kuraga, etc. from games like Kingdom Hearts, but in those games and other Square Enix games, I always saw haste, slow, stop, and other random abilities and moves that I never really knew about until I tried them out myself here in Final Fantasy VII with the Materia system. Of course, they're all situational to each game, but these time spells really spiced up the combat for me specifically. 
problems I had were some parts of the game really felt like I needed to grind because of some difficulty spikes and because of those I felt like I had to rely on my summons way more than I needed to. Case in point was the Demon's Gate, which to me was the hardest boss in the entire game. After dying like 4 times to it, I just had to grind a bit like crazy in the hallway outside the boss one-shotting everything with the Bahamut summon until I actually felt like I was strong enough with my materia and my levels to take him on. That's another thing, I felt like the materia growth was a little slow and I knew that there were gear and weapons that double and even triple the materia growth but since I was just focusing on the story for the most part I didn't really go out of my way to get any of those. I just stuck to the sets that I needed for that part of the game specifically with the materia that was already there on my character. Also, speaking of materia, that materia menu is an absolute nightmare. It's so annoying and so tedious scrolling around just to find one random materia that you need. Also, there was one time in the game I thought I lost one of my lightning materia, only to find it all the way down on my list. Like, I will say, I, I didn't really tinker around with the auto sorting option then but it's also another usability problem since it's hidden under a few other options as well just annoyingly tedious the map was too bare bones as well since i always had to rely on a guide to tell me where to go i hated having to drive around half the continent in the buggy or the tiny bronco trying to find the temple of the ancients or even when I got the high wind, it was a hassle to find specific locations, like the Bone Village that are tucked away in the most random places. I wish there was a better map that not only had dots for the points of interest, but actual names of places to go to make it easier. Or maybe if there was a Final Fantasy VII remake of the original PS1 version that wasn't an entire reimagining like on PS4 or PS5 that fixes the visuals, menu, map, and other annoying things and adds in a feature like, I don't know, fast travel? This game with fast travel would be so blissful, honestly. So I mentioned some of my shortcomings with the gameplay, with some of the visuals and the design choices here and there, but one thing that I will love forever, and which I still think about to this day, is the music and the soundtrack of that beautiful OST. These songs and melodies will remain with me forever and are some of the most fantastic tracks in any JRPG I have ever played. Of course, this is all the work of Nobuo Uematsu, the GOAT of JRPG compositions. Some of my favorite songs, aside from the super iconic ones, are Dear to the Heart, It's hard to stand on two feet. Searching for the man in black. Open your heart. And the forested temple. The light motifs are great and they do a signature JRPG thing of coming back at the best parts to call back to memories from earlier in the game to weave the narrative together. Like I loved hearing traces of Barret's theme in Mount Corel and traces of Aerith's theme in the Forested Temple. Of course, the Final Fantasy VII main theme 
has a lot of reoccurring light motifs across the game as well. So, here we are. I tore this game apart, but I also sang its praises quite a bit. So, what is my verdict? Where do I land on the original Final Fantasy VII? I have to say, I really liked my experience with this game. When it's all said and done, I really appreciated it and I really respect this game. But the most important thing is, as you can see with this video, I've really grown a lot over the course of playing this game and failing and coming back and picking it up again and I've just really grown as a gamer, I gotta say. Maybe it wasn't Final Fantasy VII that made me grow and mature as a gamer and fan of JRPGs, but it's kind of the opposite. My love and appreciation for JRPGs grew and thus my appreciation for games like Final Fantasy VII grew as well. At first, I didn't care, then I didn't get it, and then I was just stubborn. <laughs> but now here I am, and especially now in February 2024, when I'm recording this video, I'm gonna be honest, I can't stop thinking about this game. Rebirth is right around the corner, and I can't stop thinking of the characters, the emotional moments, the beautiful character growth the fantastic boss fights, the iconic locations. Everything is just so memorable. Rebirth will take us back to these places and I am excited, but I am also nervous. You see, now that I have context of the original from this fourth and final attempt, I can finally see what Final Fantasy VII Remake and Final Fantasy VII Rebirth are doing to change up the story. That's why I'm nervous. I loved the middle portion of Seven. I loved all the moments leading up to the epic encounter in the Forgotten Capital. But I also hope too much isn't drastically changed. Even though this is a version of FF7 that looks and feels great and I know I will enjoy, I hope it doesn't lose what makes Final Fantasy VII what it is. Aerith's death means so much to the story and it really hits home the themes of finality, destiny, and hope. Zack's absence from the story is also very important and is a major part of Cloud's character development and growth. So if they're both going to be back, if they're both going to be alive, if they're going to survive Rebirth, then what is this story going to be like? Will it still even be Final Fantasy VII? I can only hope. But I guess I have to trust Nomura, Kitase, and Hamaguchi with their master plan in this trilogy of games. So that's that. Am I a Final Fantasy VII fan now? I guess so. I played the OG, I played Crisis Core, I played Remake, and I played the Intermission DLC for Remake as well. I'm ready for Rebirth. It looks beautiful, amazing, expansive, and honestly everything I wanted it to be. The landscapes are pretty, the characters in action are are as flashy and vibrant as ever, and the gameplay and combat seem so addicting. Like I said earlier, the recreations of all these iconic moments are gonna be so cool. I'm very hyped for this game, and I am very happy and very thankful I finally got the chance to play the original Final Fantasy VII. Through the thick and thin, through the annoyances and the fun, and despite three failed attempts, I saw it through to the end. And looking back, I've grown so much over these past four to five years as a gamer and a fan of RPGs. And throughout that process, throughout this entire process, Final Fantasy VII stuck with me till the very end. Whew. So yeah, there you go. That's my journey with Final Fantasy VII. Through the thick and thin, I am finally here today, 
to tell you guys this story. Everything has been said, I've grown so much as a gamer, as a fan of RPGs, as a fan of Final Fantasy now. I think I can finally firmly say that I'm, I'm a Final Fantasy fan. I am. And I'm very, very, very excited for Rebirth. I'm very excited to make more content on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And I want to share with you guys my experience with this series, because I mentioned like that Final Fantasy binge I'm going on. Whenever and if I ever get to play 9 and 10 this year, because I really want to play them this year, I might make videos of my thoughts on them and what I felt and how I like them compared to the other Final Fantasy games I played. But I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart if you guys are still watching to the end of this video. This is one of the longest long-form videos I've ever made, so thank you so much for watching till the end, and if you enjoyed it, I would appreciate if you give this video a like, it means the world to me, and subscribe down below for more content like this. This is Anish Quick signing off, have a great day, go play some great games today. Like the original Final Fantasy VII on Nintendo Switch, on PC on PlayStation 5, which is outside, and play the remake as well. They're all great games. I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Hey guys, this is Quick. Thank you so much for watching that video. And if you enjoyed it, check out these two videos on the left. And if you aren't subscribed, why not hit that subscribe button on the way out? I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a great day and see you later.